Hey guys, what is up? It's Casey. Before we kind of get into this episode on Logan, I want to give you a quick heads up that there is a section of missing content in here, which is oh so aggravating. The tool we used to record remotely had kind of an error. Someone's internet went out. I don't know, but essentially we lost about 12 minutes of sound and it's very disappointing, but the rest of the podcast is actually quite amazing. So sit back, Listen, put in this wonderful podcast and listen to me, Vince, and Josh talk about Logan, the greatest film in the X-Men franchise. End of story. Enjoy, guys. Ah! I actually even enjoyed the standalone Wolverine film where we get the original Deadpool. Oh, Casey, no, (laughs) no, Casey, no, (laughs) no, Casey, no. I want Hilary Swank in the next Terminator movie so bad. There is nothing in this world that you give me to do to hug a robot. It's because it's so incredible and intricate that it's impossible not to notice. Music's the core of this movie. I'm born again to watch (laughs) this movie. You'll find redeeming things and you'll be thinking about it for a long time afterwards. There was no bone saw. Just John hamming it up over here. Two and a half out of three of us recommend it. <laughs> Everybody loves talking about movies. Let's talk about movies. Hey guys. Glad to have you here on the Pause Ryan Play podcast. Today of all days. Or any day, because you'll be listening to this any time of day, night, Weekday, weekend, who knows? I don't even know what time it is anymore. Anyhow, let's get into tonight's movie! Dun, 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 as you can guess. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd goes wild because we're talking <laughs> Hugh Jackman's dream film for Wolverine. Dun, 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 Logan! And I would say all of us comic book nerds dream film for Wolverine, right? Like, finally, finally, we got the movie that the Wolverine deserves and who does it deliver? Oh, it delivers. I, I can't wait to hear, hear what uh, you guys thought about it. I love Logan. It was an excellent film. I went and watched it. Did we go watch it together? I went and watched it with somebody and it was just outstanding. And I was like, this is the movie we've been waiting for. And it was so good. And I wasn't disappointed at all. So I don't know. Let's dive into this. Let's get let's get going. Vince, you got any facts for us? Okay. So, this movie came out March 3rd, 2017, was directed and written by James Mangold, also written by Scott Frank and Michael Green. The movie had a 97 million dollar budget. Um one of the uh ways that they were able to do everything that they wanted to to do with the movie, you know, make it rated R, make it more uh adult. Um, all that kind of stuff is they they pitched for a lower budget film, grossed six hundred and nineteen million dollars. Um, wow. This this did come out come out after Deadpool, but so like so like a lot of studios were like, oh look, there is money in a rated R comic book movie. So this did come out after Deadpool, but was always planned as a rated R movie. So Deadpool wouldn't have affected whether Deadpool had, had done well or not. It wouldn't have affected the, the rating of the movie. Um, basically, James Mangold said that he wanted to be able to... He wanted the R rating because not for the glor- like the gory scenes, not for you know being able to like push the limits of violence or whatever, but he wanted to tell an adult story that people who grew up on these comic book characters, especially the Wolverine, who's one of the most like mature, dark violent characters in movie cinema you know, or in, in comic book history yeah. um, up there with like the Punisher and a bunch of other characters. He's just like, I wanted to deliver the fans who grew up with him a, mo- a grown up movie. And with an R rated movie, we could just like spread our wings and tell a more mature story. And the violence is like big and gory and gross, but it has impact and meaning, you know, and, and, yeah, and, and it, it paid off. I mean, they made a ton of money off of it. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, they gave it a critic score of 93% and an audience score of 90%. And IMDb gave it an 8.8.1. And this was nominated for a single Oscar, 
which was Best Adapted Screenplay. Hello, this message is to inform you we have had technical difficulties. Thank you for your understanding. The pause rewind play episode on Logan will resume now. What did, what did you what was your guys' favorite parts? Like what stood out to you more than anything? What was your favorite scenes? Ooh, that's a good question here. Josh, do you got yours right off the top of your head? I'm gonna take favorite scene as a scene that like moved me or sort of made me think or be like crazy the most. <laughs> my f- my favorite scene was the entire sequence that happened with the family at the farm. Like, that entire part was just crazy. It was insane. Like, I felt so bad for these people. And I was like, oh, no, this person will be left without this person. Or, oh, no, this guy's going to be left with these problems because of what he did. And even though it's super sad to say, none of it mattered because they all ended up dead anyway. So (laughs) it's super sad, but also, like, things kind of tied themselves up and also some of those guys who were doing bad stuff also kind of got what they deserved but the family didn't get what they deserved it was super sad but the action scenes were super intense i loved you know the beginning when you know they go out to fix the water pump and logan's out there and they all like get scared and stuff but then when they get back and the um what's the guy's name like 24 the young Wolverine X24. Yeah, like uh-huh. the young yeah, him. The young Wolverine is there and they have their whole fight scene. It's super crazy. And I and I told you guys earlier that I watched that video of like the best like one liners before someone like killing someone. Steven Merchant's line should be in there when he oh, pulls that's... the pants on those grenades and he's like, Beware of the light and he checks them and it explodes the freaking van. That yes. was awesome. That was definitely should have made this list that I watched. But that whole scene between the fighting, between the family being so nice and then just not getting what they deserved, which was super heart wrenching, to Charles suffering the injury that would inevitably lead to his death. Just crazy all around, emotions flying all over the place, action flying all over the place. What a crazy scene. That was literally the scene I was talking about earlier where. You know, Charles gets stabbed through the chest by X-24 and my eyes start to tear up. And then Logan shows up and makes the decision on, you know, whether to chase down Lara and save Lara or go check up on Charles. And he chooses to go check on Charles. And the first thing he says to him is, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Like he has to, in this life of violence that he is led this entire time he's like the one person that i have left the one person that i respect the most is on his deathbed and i can't let him go out thinking that it was me doing another bad thing you know it was just that was the moment where i was just like the first tear drops down on my cheek and then they go out into the yard and that giant fight scene breaks out and i have these tears going down my eyes but also i'm just like this is so cool (laughs) well that that fight scene i have a question and maybe you can clarify this for me because i didn't want to read into it because i wanted to know if you knew about it but did logan kill everyone in the the school like or were they eradicated due to the like the purge of the mutants so that that's kind of what i alluded to in in my monologue earlier um yeah if you if on repeat viewing, you'll notice that uh, Charles is actually blames Logan for killing all the X Men, right? Yeah. But but what really happened, and you pick it up through like radio, the radio recordings that they're listening to on the road and stuff, where they're like after um, the the freak out that Charles has in the casino and everyone freezes. They say something like, "This hasn't happened since the the time in in Westchester or whatever." And it's basically alluding to the death of the X-Men. Um, Logan is keeping it a secret from Charles because Charles is such this this good guy and he knows how much it would hurt Charles to know what happened. But the reason that Logan is holding him in that tank in Mexico is because he had one of those seizures back in Westchester. And that seizure, seizure ended up killing everybody except for Logan. So Professor X was the one who actually killed his team, the X-Men. 
Oh my goodness. And yeah. Logan Logan is keeping him so drugged up because he doesn't want that to happen again, but he's also protecting Charles from that memory, from knowing that he was the one that killed the family. And he's playing that role of the villain that he's always played. He's like, I'm a bad guy. I've done terrible things. I'm not happy anyway. I can burden this on top of all the guilt that I feel for all the bad things that I've done just so you can go out feeling like you're a good guy. You don't need to hold this terrible thing that happened, accident that happened on on your shoulders. I'll take that for you. That's another one of these things that's just like so emotional that just like brings it up in me. Just like, man, Logan, he's he's such a good guy. I mean, he's like not like he does terrible things, but like he's trying so hard not to be that person. That's crazy. That's what I was wondering. I was like, something happened that was out of either of them's control, really. And I just didn't know what it was. But I had read rumors, and I just didn't want to dig into it too deep because I knew that you could give me an answer that made sense. Yeah. So yeah. Charles, in that scene, Charles actually remembers when X-24 walks in, Charles remembers that, you know, he says something along the lines of, I remember what happened in Westchester and blah, blah, blah. He starts to, like, come back to his memory and it's just, whew, whew. Yeah, I remember that now. Okay, okay. Whew, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Well, I guess for me, like, I really enjoyed like the early scenes between Lara and Logan, um, where she's just kind of being her mute self, and he just is kind of like talking to her, and she just then like she freaks out in Spanish, right? And he's like, "You can speak after all," and she just like goes off, and she's like, "Take me here, take me here," and then. He just like being stubborn. And I, I like kind of like the early, early parts of that relationship building, which I loved mm -hmm. as well as just like the excellent. Um, yeah. That, that scene you guys have talked about the house scene. I loved it too a lot because it showed like a non-typical horse riding cowboy family from what we see in like movies all the time, um, which I think is kind of cool. Cause I, I, I kind of joked the other day that horses were for everyone on my, um, instagram and like it wasn't meant to be like a joke isn't funny it's more like a lot of times like we have this stereotype of people fitting into certain roles and and like i just like that because after we talked seen after i'd watched this movie i'd seen that and i was like yeah i love that and uh i don't know i think i think that's cool and then i actually really enjoyed the final fighting sequence um that is such like a crazy thing when he takes like the shot of like the master drug and he just goes berserk, right? Like he just can kind of does this thing and then it starts to wear out. And that's when like X 22 comes out and like, or whatever number of mutant that is machine bread thing. And then like, he just still somehow like does all this stuff and he in includes Laura and in things. And he still like gives her like purpose and reason and like, that father figure to the end almost it seems which i thought was cool so cool it's so well done and it's so welcome to see over and over in the movie that rage that logan has behind him you know yeah. that's been held back by that pg-13 rating <laughs> i mean <clears throat> the very beginning of this movie just sets the tone of everything he wakes up in the back of his limo steps out and a bunch like a street gang is like jack in his car <laughs> and he tries to be that guy that he's trying to be he tries to be nice about it and warns him you know walk away they refuse to do it and just that rage takes over and he just destroys everyone and then you just like you said case you see that at the end just takes that vial just jacks himself up and just goes full berserker rage on everybody <laughs> Also, I just remembered he busted the gun in half out in the field at the farm. Like, just like, he was like, you don't want to do that, bub. And like, tsh, breaks the gun. Like, freaking roid rage right there. So impressive, <laughs> though. So, like, I'm not going to lie. I forgot at the very beginning of the movie, like, what exactly like Wolverine's powers were? <laughs> so, those, those dudes blasted him, and I was like, "What the heck just happened?" It's like a crazy fast. Like, is this like the end of the movie that it's going or something like that? And I was like, "Oh wait, no, the dude heals himself." Well, right, okay, that makes a lot more sense. I just for a second was shook, just like, "Whoa, <laughs> what just happened?" So, I'm also, glad that I remembered afterward. Also, the comedy right there is so good, whereas, like, his 
you know, don't is claws. Well, claws don't come out, and so he's like shaking them to get out. He's like, "Come on now, work for me." And like, what's sad is later, you know, he has to go like pull it out and like kind of like I don't know, put some WD forty on it. Essentially, is the only way I can think of to like get it to work. You know, he's got to like <laughs> do the motions, but like that's where it really sad. But it's so crazy that the is it adamantium? Is that what that is that they put yeah. in him? Yeah. Um, it's just so crazy that it's like poisoning him and killing him and slowing him down. When had he just retained like his little bone claws, you know, he potentially would have lived forever without like problems. And I think that's kind of mm-hmm. an interesting story arc in itself that, you know, like he became weapon X, right. And then weapon X is now killing himself because yeah. of what was put in him. So cool. You see a lot of that kind of, um, you know, the thing that makes him what he is, he, he sees himself a lot, you know, he sees the thing that makes him the strongest weapon is also killing him, you know, and then like the themes of the movie of like, uh, I was experimented on as a child and became and, and, and became this weapon. And then he sees Lara who is going through the same thing, you know, she was yeah. a clone and she's be- being bred to be a weapon. And then literally towards the end of the movie, you know, the whole theme is, is Logan trying to be the better man and trying to, you know, get over all this like guilt and everything that he's been feeling like I've been going off on for so long. And then he has to like confront a physical version of himself, how he was 20 years before when he was just this like wild animal that was nothing but fear. You know, there's just all these like, you know, what, what do you see sides to thing? You know, you see one side of it and you also see the other side of it and it just goes back and forth through the whole thing. It's really cool. It's really cool because even before, like, even for someone who hasn't seen everything, you can still see there's parallels within the movie itself, and then there's parallels to the series as a whole, right? And just seeing those parallels from every single perspective of what he's able to do and the way that he's looking at himself, who he is now, who he's become, who this new person is, who obviously is his daughter, and just what comes out of it. So it's really incredible, like you're saying, Vince. So I want to, before we move on, I want to talk about the comic books that show up in the movie uh, and just kind of get your guys' take on that because, Josh, you won't be super familiar with the uh, X-Men timeline that they established in this franchise, but I'm pretty sure it's open knowledge that it is an absolute mess of just in just just does not flow well and if you look too deep into it it just breaks itself over and over and over again (laughs) um what did you guys think of i mean it it works well in the movie but i also as a fan of the series was able to take this as an answer to this crappy timeline uh what did you guys think of the comic books was it did did you like that idea of the x-men are like famous and they're like books are written i enjoyed that actually like for me it actually was kind of fun where they are these larger than life heroes to so many because you know they came out in the public eye and they were kind of doing things and they like people would be inspired by them. So it's not surprising that there was fan fiction right there, but it also, it probably complicated their lives a little more than in other movies because they were kind of celebrities in you know, the earlier X-Men films, but could you imagine being Wolverine and like either having like, if they tell the similar story to what he is and like the comics we have, like just being this dark grizzly character or was he someone else like in these comics? Was he a little bit better? Was he, you know, a little bit more of a golden boy, but a rebel at the same time. Was he just a guy who, you know, had the cool hair and the, and the beard and, you know, the leathers and rode a motorcycle around in these things and jumped in his yellow suit. Or was he still just this raging berserker who was spiraling, spiraling out of control so often? Like it's, it's one of those things, like I really don't know, but I think it added just kind of like a depth of flavor for the film, like where it was just kind of like, Oh, he has some expectations people want him to live up to. I don't know. Mm. And there are these rumors and these ideas and like they made Eden themselves in a way. Uh, so that that's kind of interesting. And yeah, I, I don't know. How slash when 
did they make Eden? I guess I'm confused. Like, how long were these kids out of the place in Mexico to make this place come to exist? Because you know that, like, some super, like, some superhero comic fans had to have at one point or another gone to those coordinates. So there's no way that that could have really been there for forever. Maybe. Just, like, maybe, maybe it was. Maybe the writer of that issue of the comic stayed in that building to write the comic. I don't know. <laughs> mm. And he's like, this is the place. This is the cool place. I'm going to put this in here because I like this spot. I don't know. <laughs> that's not like a like a real nitpick because that's like a really weird thing. I just like had seen it and was like, interesting. How did yeah. they do this? <laughs> but Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stick with me. I'm going to tell you my uh, kind of breaking of the fourth wall that I read into this comic book. It won't take long. <clears throat> okay. So they basically said that Logan says that these comic books are existent, but only a fraction of them are true, right? Yeah. I took that as this film, Logan, is the only true canon of this franchise. And all the other movies are just like the comic books in this world. They are versions of a story that happened, but aren't exactly what happened. And if I take that idea, it fixes all of the crappy continuity. It's like, oh, okay, that happened. Who knows when it happened? And it might not have exactly happened that way, but it's just like these comic books where it's like, I can, I can kind of use that as to get an idea of what's going on in this world but I don't have to like look into it and, and hold it as canon, you know? It's open yeah. to interpretation kind of a thing. So I loved that touch of the comic books thrown in there. Not only, as you said, Casey, is it, it's this perfect like world-building idea that the, exa- the X-Men is, have established themselves as celebrities, but also, as a fan outside of the franchise, is basically a wink and a nod saying, the rest of the franchise is a mess and we know it. <laughs> If you want to take this as canon and the rest of them is kind of out there stuff, do it. Doesn't really matter at this point. The franchise is dead, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this was like a real closing chapter, not only for like like Hugh Jackman's Logan, but also just for the X Men as a whole, right? Like I know that they did Dark Phoenix afterwards. I know that they've tried to put other X Men stuff out there. But really, I felt like this was the real kind of closing of the door for that universe, because I think potentially maybe there was talks with Marvel taking over, you know, and and, you know, the changes happening. I I don't know, but I feel like this was really the the close of the door to, oh, see ya. We're out of here and we can like we'll have fun with what we have and we will make you the film you deserve. But, you know, something new is coming. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I got two questions left for you guys. I'm ready. And this all culminates at the end of the film <clears throat> with Wolverine's death. His Rift final Arden. line. His final line as he holds Lara's hand and is, and is bleeding it out is, oh, so this is what it feels like. What do you guys think he meant by those words? death and i think that there's probably definitely something else that's going on but i think that's like the the base level interpretation right it's like he has literally always been healing himself his entire life and so for me i took part of it to mean like death like dying actual physical decay without like the reparation within within himself if that makes sense I think he meant that in a physical sense and also I could take it to be a sort of parenting thing as in he really made like the final sacrifice for his daughter right and he did everything he could and you know that's such a such a big thing that happens with parenthood and um you know I'm not like really a dad I just have my dog you know but I feel like I would do a lot of stuff for my dog pretty much anything and so maybe that was a way of saying that sort of thing as well was like and and maybe it's just be like too far into it, but like he's like, oh, this is what it feels like to be like a parent or something, and literally sacrificing everything for your child to protect them. So, 
those were my sort of two different ways of looking at that line and what it could have meant. Well, and I kind of took it very similarly, but also in a different vein, because like I've watched a lot of these films, right? And I've always felt like Wolverine has something to prove to the X-Men that he belongs, right? Like him and Cyclops and like him and like other X-Men, he's always had, you know, you have your X-Men way, but I have a way of doing it as well. And him kind of like stepping up to becoming like the leader of him and Dr. Professor X, right? And him and, you know, he wanting Lara to do things in kind of this a similar vein, like he becomes appreciated. He kind of fulfills the mission to his hopeful standards, I think, as well. But also I think he's like completed the mission. He's felt loved. He is experiencing satisfaction with what he's done, knowing that he's probably pushed someone off to be as successful or as safe as they can be. Cause like Laura's like what, 10 or 11 in this. She's like a kid. Like she's not very old and he's dying and giving the world to her. And he's made it so she can go away without having to worry about, you know, whether it's another clone, you know, the X 23 or whatever, the clone masters, like whatever this might be, as far as we know, they're safe. But I wonder if there's going to be like, would they be classified as like the new mutants or something like that? Is that the next storyline with this? So I don't know. I think that Logan felt love satisfaction, but also he knew that he did a good job and the best that he could and gave everything and his, you know, flame went out and that, that was the end of it, you know, kind of my interpretation of it. Isn't that such a good line for the end of this movie, for the end of this character? That we can take that both literally as, oh, like you, like you said, Josh, take it literally as, oh, this is what death felt like. But also it means just so much more, especially in context in context of this story that it was just told of this broken man trying to find meaning in life. And just at the end of this life he's been le- living, he finds yeah. purpose and peace and love in and meaning in all of the terrible things that he's done. It's well, just can I interject for a tears, second, man? Tears. <laughs> yeah, totally tears. Can we, you remember that film that I brought up that I was like, I like this. And you like question my sanity afterwards. <laughs> yes. I freaking think, and I kind of have this idea that we can kind of piece together logan's timeline a little bit through that using that film because he was running for so long right like he had a father who really didn't love him you know his his brother brother you know like him he, they were clashing the entire time and then like he's clashing with the x-men he's clashing still to the end and he doesn't have to clash anymore like think of the relief that would give you to know like my fight is done I don't know. I think that would feel yeah, a lot man. like the midsummer moment where, I, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> Just he can finally let go and be satisfied because he did this one last good thing. So yeah. that brings me to my very last question, and it's kind of unfair for Josh not having seen the rest of this series to answer it. But Casey, I mean, you can, Josh. But Casey, I also want to. I want your opinion. Who had the better final moment? Logan or Tony Stark? What the heck are you thinking asking <laughs> that question? Holy the impossible cow. Question. The impossible question. Who had the better final moment? <laughs> Logan or Tony? Man. Because both of them have incredible story arcs over 10 years of storytelling. Longer, I mean, if you're into the comics, even longer than that, you know, if you're that familiar with the characters. But both of those moments were so perfectly laid out. It's, it just, it, it comes down to opinion. And if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. If you love both of them, that's fine. But I just wanted to throw that, that question out there. And maybe, like final... people, maybe people in the comments can answer too, you know, if they get this far in the podcast, let us know who, who had the better final moment, the better death scene, the better conclusion to their story arc logan or tony obviously unfair but i am gonna say tony stark but only by a margin cool so obviously like i don't know as much about the x-men universe and everything like that but i did think that 
his final scenes were his final scenes were perfect. He does the things that was earlier said that he would never do and making a sacrificial play and everything like that. And I get that Logan is like sort of like that as well, which is why I can't really have a ball in the court. Um, I think if, so that's like, as far as like final sacrificial scenes, if you talk about like their final, like afterwards scenes, death scenes, like after they had gone, I would also say Tony Stark just because the funeral thing was great for me. But I did like, I was all like, whoa, like when she came back and she took the cross down and she made it the X yeah. and I was like, whoa, nailed it. Uh, the feels, man. Touches it was the very, feeling. It was very cool. So obviously extremely biased. And I think even if I, like if I had seen the series, I would obviously know more about Logan's character, but I think it's still like you guys were saying sort of an impossible question to ask Vince. How dare you? I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Is this going to be another one of those moments where I put you guys into an impossible question and then I dodge the question myself? Yeah, you better not dodge it. <laughs> I'll give you my thoughts on it, okay? Oh, what have you done, Vince? What have you done? <laughs> I'm going to go with Logan, personally, and it's not because I want to oppose anyone or I want to be different here. I love Tony Stark. And I think that his final acts and his like whole story arc throughout the film, like the Marvel universe, fantastic, wonderful, great. Like I need to get that out there first. But Logan is more of the everyday man. Like he, like the very first movie, he's driving around an old clunker RV cage fighting in freaking wherever. And like, he develops he never like really changes that much which is great and i i love that about him he's scrappy he kind of just does things in his own way which we can say the same about tony stark for sure he he's scrappy even though he has so much at his disposal but like logan man like he got he tried to you know help rogue he fell in love with gene gray like even though he's kind of a dick to Cyclops, he had his back, you know, and like, he's always kind of the same way. And, oh man, but I think that I could relate more to Logan just because I've never been a billionaire playboy philanthropist, you know, like I haven't had that opportunity yet in life. But like, what is so cool about Logan is like this movie, kind of like you're talking about, like this film, I think was for me, the most emotional of all of the movies, at least of, like having Wolverine and Logan be a part of it because you're right, Vince, he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, literally. And he was like trying to find a way to continue to do so, like even hurt, even damaged. Like he was moving, moving, going and trying to keep everything on his shoulders. And as a being with limited resources, he did great and he did everything he could. And I've, I was sad. Like I cried tears when Tony Stark died. I will be honest about that. But when Logan died, I was like, no, like who's the grand protector of the realm now? Like that was what went through my mind, you know, like who's taking care of this and who's going to be there for these mutants that need not bring. Who's going to be there for Lara. And like, like I went much farther cause I knew that pepper pots and their child would be taken care of and fine. Cause they have money. But these are freaking homeless street kids, you know? They're clones. And, oh, Vince, how could you ask this it's, question? It's like, hard, man. I'm sticking with Logan, but, like, oh, my gosh, what a question. Because okay, I, I agree, I agree you with what you said. can't dodge it now. Okay, I agree <laughs> with what you said. Um, Tony literally has the weight of all the worlds on his shoulders, but Logan has the weight of his world on his shoulder. And it's such a smaller scale, but to him, it's just, you know, the feeling is just as great in a way, you know? If your whole world is crashing around you, it feels like the whole universe is crashing around you, you know? So they both have their own emotional emotional roller coaster, and they both go through this incredible story arc of, you know, Tony being this selfish person to be the one who sacrifices himself. And then Logan being this tool bred for destruction to becoming something good and 
to constantly be trying to be that person, even though everything that's happening around him, everyone around him is dying and everything is going wrong. And he's just tortured by his world falling apart. But then even in his worst moment, rising up to defend the people who need it, you know, and to, to sacrifice himself for the people who need it too. I mean, he's been trying to escape this world for so long to the point he's carrying a bullet around in his pocket. You know, he wants to die. Yeah. But Charles doesn't want him to die without knowing that the good, the world can be good, you know? And so to conclude, I agree with you, Casey. I think I prefer the Logan death over. the Oh, and it's so hard to say that, but I just, I just loved this story so, so much. And it's just so touching and so emotional. And it's just so, it's like you said, so touching to see that this man who's just ruined can find that peace in the last moments, you know? And just like I said, tears in both movies, tears. Yeah. Movies yeah, are cool. I can guys. agree that, uh, that, uh, they both in the end made the real sacrifice play to save yeah. not only the world, but their daughters who were introduced in the final movie. Yep. yep. It's a very, very similar death, but also very different in the roles that they play, the people who they are. And it's both incredible. So Vince, you did come impossible up with the question. ultimate impossible question, but I hope that we at least provided some sort of answer to it. And we, of course, want to hear what you guys think who please like message us or just in the comments after you listen to it on our Twitter or, or Facebook or Instagram posts or on YouTube. Let us know um, your answer to Vince's impossible question. Uh, Vince, you've done it. You did so good. And I think we should stop there because there's nothing else we can say that can really go anywhere else from here. Uh, So guys, really like, thank you for tuning in. Logan was a fantastic film. I love that it was radar. I love that it was that gritty film that we need. I love that emotion. And yeah, Vince, thank you for recommending we watch this movie. Uh, I freaking love it. So without any further ado, thank you always for joining us on the pause Ryan play podcast. And we will catch you next time.